Hi everybody and welcome to this, I think it's the ninth um, visual presentation session that we've got for PCST 2020 um, plus one. Um, so this session is going to be all about museums, exhibits and art. My name is Heather Doran and, and I'm part of the local organising committee for PCST 2020 plus one and part of the PCST scientific committee as well. As we run through the talk, um, we will also have the Q&A open as well. So please do ask questions there um, for the speakers. And we should have some time at the end of the presentations to have a discussion. And at the end of the session, you will have chance as well um, to vote for your, your favorite presentation um, today. And the, the winners from that poll will go on to speak at the conference, which is taking place in um, just less than two, well, less than two weeks time now. Um, so that's great, very exciting um, time. I'm looking forward to hearing all of the presentations today. So I'm just gonna give it another minute because I know people will be joining. Um, it's evening here in Scotland. Um, so um, I know it's morning in other places. <laughs> so uh, well done to anyone joining us who is um, early morning for you. Um, but yeah, it's um, dinner time here in, in Scotland, um, 6 p.m. In the evening. So I think we'll get started. We're going to be doing a mix um, this evening of sharing um, presentations. Um, I'll be sharing some on behalf of the speakers and some of the speakers will be sharing them themselves. So please bear with us as we um, set that up. So our first speaker this evening is Ricardo Candas Vega who is speaking on tiling an artistic, tiling an artistic way to understand the hyperbolic honeycomb. So are we ready to go? Yes, thank you very much. Let me... Great, I'm handing it over to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm, my name is Ricardo Candas and I, go, I come from Matemorphosis. Matemorphosis is the communication group of the CIMAT. Mexico. Hello. Okay. Some beautiful truths show for any given point, not on a given line, there is exactly exactly one lonely line through that point, and that line can only meet that given line at infinity. But maybe if this wasn't true, the loneliness will not be so eternal, and there would exist so many. I think we've got a, a slight connection issue there. We'll just give it a second to see if we can get them back. Ricardo, can you hear us? Yes. Oh, Ricardo, sorry, we, we lost you a second there. So um, if you just want to, if you're just able to go back slightly, and um, we just lost yes. your connection. Yes. Um, I think can back you, one more. Can you hear me? Yeah, we one can more. hear you now, yeah. Okay. Um, back another. Okay. Uh, um, also, symmetry could confront the loneliness, but if the lines were used as mirrors, we will see how the entire plan was tilled. That is so totally represented as a disc and the points in the border circle as the infinity points. Following this way of reasoning, of if the circle is a plan, the sphere will be the space. This space along with the anti loneliness rule give us this different dodecahedrons or whatever solid we can imagine. Changes, changes will appear like the angles with the faces sketch at each each other. The mirrors will not now be in the facets, like this cube, that is reflected in the other, but repeating the same process in all the faces and repeated the same in each new facet again and again and again, until we have something like this. Inside the honeycomb, we find something like this,
with whatever platonic solid, so, solid chosen, the imagine of hyperbolic honeycombs will be obtained. But I prefer to call them the antiloneliness honeycombs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that we can ask um, questions through the Q&A, so please do that for the speakers as they go through. That, that, thank you very much for that presentation. We could see your images and everything fine. We just lost you. Um, we lost your connection a bit there. But I think we caught back up, so thank you very much for that. So our next um, presenter is um, Miguel Garcia Guerrero, and they're going to be speaking about chain reactions for science communication. Hi, I am uh, currently working at the Science Museum at the Autonomous University of Zacatecas in the central region of Mexico. And uh, I want to share you about our work with museums, which we see as uh, kind of centers of science inspiration. We want to even go beyond our walls to inspire people to get a closer relation to, to science. Our challenge is that our state, as, as you can see in red here in Mexico, it's kind of a big state. It's up uh, over 70,000 square kilometers. And we don't have that much of a population, but it's really distributed. So we have the challenge to reach into all those people. And we realized that since we are a small museum, we only have uh, four people hired in our staff, and but we have uh, 50 volunteers, but still it's really hard to get to those all, all of those people. So what we wanted to do to, to get to them is build uh, chain reactions, create projects that uh, we can get uh, other people to collaborate and help us reach other places. We started in 2007 creating a mobile science hall that went to different towns all over the state. And we uh, trained uh, young people that were in charge of that hall and help people play and have fun with, with science with the goal that when the hall left each town, they will keep working on science recreation activities. Some of them did, most didn't. So we had like a remaining goal or get more people involved with a different approach. So that's when we decided to create science kits. There were like these big boxes with uh, enough materials to perform maybe 25 or 30 different activities. We, uh, we also provided some books with the instructions to develop said activities. So new groups could uh, do those, those activities in their towns. We could also uh, create uh, collaborations with uh, libraries, with teachers from the schools in the in towns in the state. And that helped us uh, create a, a broader network of uh, people willing to collaborate and help us uh, make these chain reactions, but with the problem of getting the researches so, so they could keep uh, making the activities once they uh, they did the first ones and they no longer have uh, materials. Now we're trying to establish a network of uh, science clubs. We want children to be able just not going once to, to participate in science activities, but go each week uh, have some recurrence so they build really closer relationships with with science we were ready to start with this network but then the pandemic hit and we, with all the covid problems we we haven't been able to start working really with the children of our state but we hope to do that uh, in the near future um, that's uh, like a quick uh, glimpse of what we're doing uh, i'll be happy to answer your your questions in the in the final session Okay, thank you very much. And yeah, under time, everyone's sticking to time so far. So that's very good. Um, thank you for that. 
Um, so our next um, speaker and talk is Karina Lopetti, um, who is talking about Ouroboros, science, arts and inclusion. It's okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Karina. So I present some activities of Ouroboros. Yes, the activity that you developed in Brazil. So the mission of the project is performing a cutting edge research on the interplay between scientific communication acts, as well as using outcomes of research to benefit the general public. Goals of the project is to promote a life transforming river for people engaging in science extension activities, communicate science and in inclusive approach by means of theatrical plays, musical performance, and illustrations, improving personal skills, and humanize the project. You manage by competence, taking account the limitation of each participant, visually impaired or with reduced mobility, and promote the respect for the social diversity and check how science and the many cultural manifestations are blended together and present in plays, musical performance, and other cultural meetings. So in the methodologies, we present our online meetings with undergraduate and graduate students, professors from the university and local members. Uh, leading to the reach of diverse range of skills, training, worldview, and in the creative process of each cultural product. We practice empathy towards the participants from several different social backgrounds, especially those with physical disability, in respect of for the social demands né, throughout the theater play and the works, uh, uh, workshop construction. So we promote different levels of types of discussion, fostering curiosity about science, scientists, art, and artists. Here are some examples of Olhares, the group that you practice together along um, 12 years. This is the new science theater. We talk about uh, science um, of life of scientists like Marie Curie and uh, about science aspects like light, yeah, and uh, uh, history of chemistry and circles or history of glass. So, uh, talk about water and the importance for earth so we have some events like science on stage and the uh, circles of science and the care so these are science communication for general public for kids uh, mainly and this is it this is the vitro sounds orchestra yeah the the um, musicians uh, with glass instruments you present in pcst in new zealand in 2018 and the group continued uh, going uh, online, yeah. Uh, here you have Clip Sidver and uh, the Funny Science Online. So the results, uh, you engage a lot, thousand of students and they acting together for t t 12 years and the social technology provided these unexpected transformative paths, yeah. And they permit to relocate these people in the society. So this presentation is in memory of Marcelo that died this week because COVID, but we are keeping going on. So Ouroboros at home and thank you for the sponsor and for all of you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Karina. And um, well, so far, the, all the presentations have had some incredible images in them. So it's been amazing um, to see those. Um, so this is a really a good session to, to have. And uh, yeah, I love the themes of museums, exhibits and art um, and bringing those all together. So our next speaker is uh, Daniela Martin, who is speaking on theme parks, the science communication spaces, the Epcot space. Thank you, Heather. OK, so I'm just getting ready. OK. Well, hi, my name is Daniela Martin, and today I'll talk about theme parks as science communication spaces. <clears throat> Our perception of reality is increasingly mediatized by what is produced by the cultural industries. These industries can be considered battlefields where cultural, political, social, and even economic wars are fought. This research is based on the theory of John B. Thompson, who explains that the symbolic constructions of reality shape and mold the behaviors, the philias, and the thoughts of the masses. 
The objective was to analyze the symbolic construction of the future in the discourse of Epcot, a theme park in Walt Disney World in Orlando, Florida, where science, culture, and technology are presented in a contextualized way as human and social activities. Test Track is one of the four attractions analyzed, and it was sponsored by General Motors until 2009 and currently by Chevrolet, a brand of the same company. In this attraction, visitors must create their own conceptual vehicle and test it in the simulator. The vehicles of each of the simulator's occupants compete against each other in tests that measure their power, capacity, reaction, and efficiency. While the automobile is still one of the main players in everyday life, today's car companies are much more committed to the efficiency of their engines to reduce environmental impacts. However, this was not always the case. There are records that between 1935 and 1956, General Motors bought more than 100 electric transportation systems in the US and turned them into scrap metal. This shows that the corporate decisions of this company are subordinated to the market and that environmental care having become profitable is being commercially exploited. Test Track's discourse, which seems to propose a transition towards other ways of conceiving the relationship with the environment, is overshadowed by the prevalence of the consumer culture. Epcot is supposed to be a showcase of scientific and technological innovations that could lead us to a better future. But the notion of progress that is presented in its attractions doesn't show the origin nor complexity of certain topics such as the climate crisis. In this sense, their key messages are not aimed to create awareness about the impacts of science and technology in the world, but to help their sponsors to gain a privileged and positive symbolic position in the social imaginary. Finally, Epcot is an example of the power that a dominant cultural industry can have over the public perception of a particular topic. In this sense, cultural industries need to be considered as a key tool for science communication, and as such, they should be held accountable for the narrative they're conveying to their public. Epcot is a great example of how science and technology can be communicated through compelling storytelling in a leisure environment with a great impact on the public. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that presentation and um, nicely done in the time as well. That was a lot of content in there and uh, you were under time <laughs> and you covered an awful lot. So that was that was really great, thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Marcio Pinto Fabrico, who is speaking on exploring science where it is made an open air and digital museum in a Brazilian university. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tarsio, and my speaking from Brazil. Today, I'm happy to present to you the Caminhos do Conhecimento Open, Open Air Museum. We focus on how physical space can support educational activities and learning experience. Therefore, at Caminhos do Conhecimento, we have trails around the campus at the Federal University of São Carlos, formed by a series of points uh, of interest where dissemination actions take place. In our first edition, we had 17 points. Uh, such, such points form a path around the campus at each of the points of physical support related to a specific team is located, as shown. The physical support presents the names of the points, content about the area of knowledge and QR codes that take the visitor to the virtual environment, shown in the figures. In this environment, each point is a, an entry to diverse materials, such as videos, podcasts, and links. In each point, visitors can also enter some labs and chats with researchers, but only during uh, guided visits. Today, two different paths are in operation the knowledge trail with space through all points and areas of 
knowledge and the light trail aimed at children. The figures show images from videos and which path. Thank you very much for listening. And I would also like to thank FAPESP for the funding. I hope to meet you soon at Caminhos do Conhecimento. Thank you very much um, for that presentation. Um, I, I love the name of the light trail. Um, it's just so inviting. I would like to go on the light trail and see that. Um, so our next um, speaker is going to be uh, Jessica Roberto Rocca from um, Brazil, who's going to be speaking about towards a more inclusive science communication in museums, a case study of Brazilians with visual disabilities. Great. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here sharing uh, with you our research. Uh, we developed in 19, in, in two, uh, 2017, a survey aiming, aimed to understand how Latin American science museums were addressing accessibility. As a result, we had 109 science museums from 12 countries that are somehow implementing strategies toward accessibility and inclusion. However, it also revealed a gap between good intentions and re regular practices for promoting full and equal enjoyment. Also, we've um, seen that most of the actions to promote accessibility are being performed on physical infrastructures and regarding communicational and attitudinal accessibility, they still have only a few actions. So the culture of, the, of inclusion is not incorporated into institutional policy and into the allocation of financial resources. Uh, another study specifically from Brazil was developed to, co to comprehend how staff, mediators, explainers, educators understand accessibility and feel about their interactions with people with disabilities. 200, uh, 298 individuals from across the country answered our survey and we saw that there are still some gaps in their training, practice and experience which make them feel apprehensive about providing services to the public with disabilities. Many received some type of training, but they still feel unconfident. So now we are doing qualitative studies uh, to try to understand how and why accessibility and inclusion are or are not being uh, happening in local contexts and personal stories through interviews with people with disabilities and museum staffs. So we have here a uh, research from Mariana Fernanda. Fernandes, who interviewed staff, visitors, and recorded the guide visits in two science, science museums in Rio. And some results were that um, people with disabilities expressed their desire to engage in science and in science museums. However, museums do not know how many people with disabilities visit them, nor their characteristics. Managers explain that there is no specific my budget for promoting accessibility. This issue is generally reliant on special project resources, which is seen as a consequence of little political and institutional support and mostly viewed as a significant bar barrier. <clears throat> as final thought, learning from the visitors uh, and their personal stories is essential if you want to think about diversity. And as challenges, we listed increased studies in the area, have space with, uh, for people with disabilities to participate as agents, researchers, and professionals, not only as visitors, and assume accessibility and institutional policy as a mission of the institution. So that's it. Thanks for being here with me. Thank you very much, um, uh, Jessica. Um, 
just a reminder as well to the people that have joined the session, I can see there's a few people that have joined us after we started, that please do use the Q&A function. You should be able to see two little speech bubbles um, and there you can ask questions, um, which we will come to at the end of the presentations and you can vote up questions as well. So if you see a question that you particularly like, you can click on the thumbs up and, and that'll move up, up the queue for the questions. So our next speaker, we are going from um, Brazil over to Canada now. So we have got Catherine Eleanor O'Hara, who's going to be talking um, about two streams, one bridge, cultural version into Sky Artland. Um, and I just need to set this up on my screen. So bear with me one second while we do that. Um, I will share my screen. There we go. I think we everyone should be able to see that. So Catherine, it's over to you. Thank you, Heather. And uh, hello from Ottawa. Happy to be here today. I'd like to acknowledge first that I'm on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Ashinaabe Nation. Uh, Carleton University also acknowledges its responsibility to adhere to Algonquin cultural protocols and respect the culture and traditions of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Next slide. Yes, so I wondered where Sci Art first made an appearance as a modern movement. One story has it that it was kickstarted by Billy Kluver, who was an electrical engineer at Bell Labs in New Jersey. And he decided it was time for a large scale collaboration between scientists and artists. And he rounded up 30 scientists and like minded engineers from Bell Labs and brought them down to the East Village, hooked them up with 10 well known artists, and they spawned nine evenings of theater art technology, which was by most accounts successful and did launch new art with new media. And 30 years later in London, the Welcome Trust supported an art and science collaboration, an institutional start to promoting new incentive and funding for artists working with scientists on medical and biosciences research. The wife of one of the organizers apparently named it SciArt. So next slide. Just as there are many branches of science and forms of art, there's no one way to really define what passes as sci art. I asked a few people in the field about labels. Alice's definitions of sci art speaks to a broad range of possibilities. Longtime bio artist and theorist Suzanne Acker calls her art science a renegade child to help us focus on a fragile planet. And Craig, who's a gallerist, allows that the term sci art doesn't travel in the mainstream of art. It never has. So then, is sci art's main currency, science communication. Next slide. Obviously, the collaborative nature of artists and scientists, makers and technicians is a defining trait. It's almost in its genes, you could say. But communicating science through imaginative and thought inducing art is also good for science in a popular sense. That's why science museums and science centers, research organizations, academic spaces, often provide the space and funds for SciArts to grow, and now along with social media exposure, grow even more. But SciArt is seen to be tilted towards educational purposes, unlike other art. Is there a limitation here? Art seemingly in the service of science as a handmaiden doesn't sit well in an age of increasing emphasis on equality and inclusion. Maybe it's time for a repurposing. Next slide. Bettina Fourget is a space artist and head of the artist in residence program for the SETI Institute. She thinks that women are getting braver in accessing science labs for their art. So the next step is to promote equal footing in the vital research question, moving away from fetishizing science, artists hanging on scientists to science communication, still significant, but looking through the lens of research practice is possibly a better way to imagine a sustainable sci art. And I'll leave you with the next slide for one second, that's all I have. Um, and you can look up some of these things. Some are art, sci art, some are not sci art, but wanting to look is always a good place to start and a good place for me to end, thank you. Thank you very much. And again, some incredible images and visuals um, shared there on that presentation. Um, I just need to set that up and I can So we have our next pre presenter. So we have Lutz Helena Oviedo, um, who's going to be speaking about Museum for Change, local paleontologist impact on their community. Yes, hello everybody. Um, okay, 
So my name is Luz Elena. I'm from Colombia. And right now I'm working at Parque Explora Science Center in Medellin. So, okay, let me just, okay. What is now a desert? We, so yeah, it used to be a tropical forest 12 million years ago. And you can see how we think it looked like. Uh, a world-class fossilifer site studied by foreign researchers, uh, mostly from uh, the US, uh, Europe, and Japan studied this site for the last 100 years, uh, is now also studied by locals. And you can see there uh, Andres Banegas, which is uh, the one of the stars of this story uh, being part of one of the articles. <clears throat> what it used to be a childhood dream, and you can see here the inhabitants of the desert as little kids uh, going to look for fossils in the desert. It is now a natural history museum which has impacted uh, the community, La Victoria, which is a town of about 2000 uh, people. Inhabitants of La Tatacoa Desert in rural Colombia are interested in protecting paleontological heritage. So in the, in the picture at the top, you can see um, the pre, how, how the house uh, looked before, and that's the house where they lived and they have transformed into a museum. So they partnered with the Science Center, Park Explora, and a research institute, the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama to develop the first exhibit for the Museo de Historia Natural, eh, La Tatacoa in rural Colombia, which right now it has the biggest and most complete um, collection of fossils uh, from the, these sites that is uh, very famous among uh, paleontologists. Uh, so we had some challenges because we built this exhibit for the planetarium in Medellin and then also uh, for La Victoria. So we had this uh, challenge of make it uh, fit for two different scenarios for uh, different publics. Uh, we also wanted an exhibit that had a uh, low maintenance and low tech. So they have, they don't need uh, like a lot of uh, work if anything happens with the exhibit. Uh, so these are some of the pictures, how it looks, some of the experiences. This is for example, a timeline, uh, a collection of their objects as uh, local paleontologists. Uh, this is some of the pictures of the planetarium and the public agenda and social media content that we developed. And um, some of the outcomes uh, wanna focus on the community. They have their first, their first exhibit. They also had a lot of media coverage and visibility, uh, capacity building. They know how a museum works and how uh, you can develop an exhibit, how you can work with allies. Uh, this increased their sense of identity in the, in the community and the region and their paleontological heritage. And of course, this increased uh, the tourism in the region. So this is a very nice experiment of how uh, a science center, a research institute and a community uh, can are able to collaborate among them. So how a museum can trigger social, social change in a community. These are some of the testimonies. And that's it. Thank you very much. Fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I know that we've had so many, all of them are fantastic presentations this evening. Um, so it's been really, really exciting to listen to you all. We have two speakers still to go. Um, so we'll remind everyone, please use the Q&A to ask questions. We'll have plenty of time to ask questions of the presenters. Um, after all the presentations are finished. So I think I need to queue up another presentation here because we've got our next presenter who is Rojillo Ramirez from Uruguay. Um, and this is Science Communication Lab, Transforming Practice to an Exercise of Collective Intelligence. Um, so just give me one second while I get this presentation I'm ready to share. And I'll share my screen. Okay, we're ready. Hi, hi everyone. My name is Rocio and I'm from Montevideo, Uruguay, a very little country in the south of America. 
So um, I'm, I'm a bit of outsider here, I think, because it's not about museums or art, but it's about a, a new kind of training we, we developed for three consecutive years in Uruguay. And, and I think it's worth sharing because it's different. It's a different experience. Um, so we, we call it Science Communication Lab. Next slide, please. Because, uh, well, why, why we do it? Why a SICOM lab? Because in Uruguay, as in many countries in Latin America, there is almost no formal training in science communication. And we believe this is very important to, to be professional, to, to do the things, to, to have a real impact. We, we, we have to take it seriously. So we decided with, this, with the collaboration of the Spanish International Cooperation Agency, they started to, to make some experiences and we also, uh, we collaborate. I, I work in a science research institute and we decided to, to make a, a, a different kind of training. So um, next slide, please. Why, why this training is different? Because it's free, it's for everyone. Uh, and it's, it has a cooperation for development uh, background because we, we are convinced that science communication is a way to change, uh, to social change. So, because we need, we need it socially. And it also occurs out of academia. It's, it's not an academic training, but it's, it's done uh, with science communication professionals and advocates from academia, people with a lot of experience. Next slide, please. So, well, we know it's valuable because uh, it, it, it sparked huge interest uh, quickly and gained support from, from different agencies in, in Uruguay and in the region. Sorry, I, I lost the, why no? Because, well, it, it gained support. It, uh, for example, from the Innovation and Research Agency, Agency and the Ministry of Education and Culture, UNESCO at the regional level, and the Organization of Ibero-American Ibero States. I don't know if you, maybe you, you know it. So we get financial support. And well, may, many public agencies related to science, technology, and innovation want to participate or want to take part in, in the future. We did three editions. and. From the first one, we, we caught a lot of attention and, and many participants. For example, the first edition convoked 120 students and the last one, last year, 700 inscriptions from Latin America. So, well, in this slide is, I'm a kind of mother of communicators. <laughs> now it's not, a, I, I'm proud of, of this project and I think it's, it's worth sharing because uh, it's different. And well, also it has finally, I, I'm good with the time, sorry. Uh, it, it's also, it, it's valuable because uh, academics start, uh, well, it's, uh, it confronts different professional profiles and working realities. We have journalists, academics, but we also have politicians, technicians, and, and they know get to know each other a lot and, and start seeing the other reality differently and and break barriers. And I'm gonna have to just stop you there because we have got we have gone over time, but um, we'll come back um in the in the QA to have a little bit more chat. So sorry about that. So if I stop sharing my screen, we come back over here. <laughs> Okay, so we just have one presentation left um, this evening. So we have um, Jan Swierkowski from Portugal, who is talking about stellar entanglement in VR video. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. That's the uh, that's my presentation. Um, Stellar Entanglement um, is an art and science pop-up center that we've done in Ponta Delgada in the Azores. 
um, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of uh, Catholic University of Portugal and University of Copenhagen in art and science. So I'm really happy that art and science is gaining some recognition even during our session. Stellar Entanglement uh, is the most recent uh, multimedia project uh, which was created by Institute B61, an art and science group from the University of Nikolaus Copernicus in Torun. Uh, and it was a collaborative project between more than 50 artists and scientists uh, from Poland, Portugal, India, and Italy, which was created in the Azores Archipelago in cooperation with the municipality of Ponta Delgada and Tremor Music Festival. And uh, Stellar Entanglement was an art and science pop-up center uh, in a historical sugar factory called Sinaga. Uh, and the main scientific topic of this art and science pop-up center was the stellar evolution and the quantum entanglement, which was explained during an immersive journey through a fictional astronomical research facility. And in the end, this uh, journey that the audience took was turned into a VR experience, which is now shown as, a, um, as an installation. Mm, what are art and science pop-up centers uh, created by Institute B61? They are immersive performances in intriguing spaces like forts, factories, or railway stations, which are prepared as site-specific events outside the traditional museums or white cubes, black boxes. Mm, and art and science pop-up centers have a modular structure in which subsequent scenes take place in new spaces and the audience follows from one module to another, not being able to return to the spaces they have left behind. The individual modules are prepared in collaboration between artists and scientists. Each of the modules is different in its form as they draw from a variety of artistic expressions and traditions dominated mainly by performances, live acts, video art, sound art, and many more. And this collaboration is done according to the conceptual blending um, methodology. I won't get into details because obviously th there is no time, but we try to create experiences of, for example, what would it be in like, uh, what, what would it be like inside of the core of a star? And we try to build, we um, um, uh, bring artists and scientists together into a dialogue, and then they create uh, an immersive experience. And they came up, for example, with an immersive experience of uh, how a core of a star would look like, or um, how a planetary nebula would taste like. Um, and this pop-up science center was held for um, um, more than a week in Ponta Delgada. It, it was uh, uh, very well um, received by the public and by the press. Um, and in the end, as I was saying, it was uh, turned into a, a VR experience, which is now shown as an installation. And that's it. I um, hope I'm still in time. Thank you so much. Perfectly timed. <laughs> um, thank you very much um, for that presentation. Um, if you could um, just stop sharing your screen, that would be great because we're going to move that's into exactly the Q&A. So it would be, be great for people to be able to. Um, see people on the screen as they answer questions. So I'm going to go over to the, the Q&A um, chat because there's quite a few questions that have come, come in there. First, they want to thank you all for your talks. They were, they were all um, fantastic, and such interesting um, and important topics um, that we covered this evening as well. So the first question is for Karina um, and it's from Emma Whitecamp. What challenges did you face in moving your performances online? And did you find you reach your usual audience or new audiences through the online medium? Yes, I think it's double difficult because they're, well, okay, the Olares looks groups are blind people, yeah? So we have this, this first challenge is that is introduced then in the technology. And um, okay, so once they are introduced, you, you start to to prepare the the theater play. Yeah? You perform clepsydra that we already um, uh, did um, um, presential mode, so it's a little easier. And um, the the audience is different, yeah, because um, okay, we read uh, people around Brazil, around the world. <laughs> and um, OK, I think it's a, a huge audience, more people that you can reach, touch. And um, a new 
a new play i think it's um okay you can discuss a lot yeah you can do this with uh, our technology nowadays but uh, the performance the okay stage is very different from this windows yeah so you need to think about yeah what is this kind of uh, theater in web theater and uh, what is theater in uh, stage so it's, dif it's different yeah so, but uh, i think you can perform this yeah Thank you very much, um, Karina. Um, just to mention as well to all of the speakers this evening, you can type some answers as well in, in the Q&A if you wish to do so and wish to add anything um, in that. Um, so I'll just quickly answer that one live. Um, so uh, next question is to um, Ricardo. Um, great work, congratulations. So each honeycomb we saw was created from a platonic solid, question mark, or were, uh, were there any other structure involved? Okay, before to answer, I, I, I just want to say this is, uh, the, or the idea of, of behind of this is create some virtual place uh, where, where the people can interact, interact with all this image to understand the symmetry. And, and uh, almost the, uh, the platonic solid. And the answer to this question is yes, all the platonic solids are involved created to create the hyperbolic honeycombs in 3D uh, from the, the flat uh, figures uh, like Asher's. Asher's use it to, to draw so some draws. And um, you can use all, uh, almost the numbers bigger than two. Um, and that's it you have uh, two opportunity to create so many different figures with web, your preferred numbers. And the idea of it is to something like that. Okay, thank you very much. And um, next question is for uh, Jessica. Um, thanks for the work. What major difficulties have you encountered for people with disabilities in accessing live experiences in museums? In your opinion, what are the challenges facing a museum to become accessible to people with disabilities? Mm, great question. Thank you for Anonymous <laughs> for uh, making this interesting question. Actually, um, one of the most, as I, I said on the presentation, one of the most, uh, most <clears throat> great um, difficult problem is the accessibility in communication and because for example if you have a, de a deaf people we don't have people who uh, who can speak uh, sign language for example in science museums or we have just little staff who can communication in sign language or Brazilian sign language or um, Argentinian sign language, Colombian sign language, we have many languages uh, in Latin America. But also we have another big issue, which is uh, financial support. Most of the activities uh, focused on people with disabilities depend on specific projects or specific budget that are not continuous. So they start, they have a uh, time for starting and a time for ending. And it's not part of the institutional policy. So these type of activities uh, don't have uh, strategies for continuation or for being immersed in the history of the institutions. So we have many gaps, especially in, in times, in crisis times. For example, now in Brazil, we have a very huge uh, political economic crisis. So these are the activities that are first uh, <laughs> closed in the museums, the, the activities focused on diversity or focused on people with disabilities because we don't have uh, planning or final continuous resources for it, for it. So the, the biggest barrier is sure an institutional 
policy uh, and to have the accessibility in the uh, in the in the mission of the institution. So this is the greatest uh, challenge for us in Latin America nowadays. I hope I answered. Thank the you question. very much. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next question we've got is to Rocio. How was the experience bringing practitioners and academics involved in science communication together and how did their approaches um, differ? <laughs> well, it's a great question. I, I suggest you all put academics and journalists at least uh, in practice, in collective practice, because it's, it's an before and after, you know, is um, is really interesting and good for all of them to see the reality, the other one's reality. For example, um, I work in a research institution, and some researchers went to the to the training cycle and and didn't know what a, a press release was. The, the journalist said, "Well, I I press release. What what's that? What's that?" Uh, it's just that is like woo. It's a, it's a new world, so it, you should. These things should be done. We 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 need to <laughs> merge. <laughs> and well, they differ a lot. I, I I it's been seven years that I work as a science science communicator professional in a research research institution, trying to. To convince researchers to do outreach and 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 well uh, outreach basically, but also go into the media and and they they have they are afraid they don't know the, the how, how do they work and and sometimes they confront a lot. So we need more training and we need that because it's it's really different the the way they see things. I don't want to be extensive. Thank you. That's great. Thank you very much for, for sharing those reflections. Um, I'm going to jump to a question um, that I wanted to ask, and then I think we're going to come back to the other one in the Q&A, because I think that's a really good one to, to end on and have a bit of a chat about that. I wanted to ask um, um, uh, Catherine the question. So you spoke a little at the end about a more equitable approach um, and I wanted to know if you could speak a little bit more about that, if there was anything in particular you thought could be put into place to help achieve that, either by scientists or through artists or through institutions that could help make that happen. Uh, thank you for asking me that because it's weighed on my mind too. I'm thinking, I, I said it and what did I mean by it? And one of the things I was talking about was um, the idea that uh, I guess the, the artist who started it for me, one of them was uh, Bettina Forge because she was saying, she just did that series called um, Impact Statement. And basically it was the fact that women were so underrepresented in the names of, com of craters on the moon, only 3% are women um, craters were named after women. So she made a big point of trying to do that. But her, her argument to me was because I asked her about that whole notion of uh, women feeling underwhelmed uh, in some ways or discriminated against, especially in certain sciences. And she, she felt that because there'd been this um, an emphasis on the beauty of the way artists is, are portraying different elements of the phenomena of science, that it's overshadowed the fact that there were these inequalities in the actual way that research was being conducted. So that, that a lot of scientists were okay, you know, collaborating with artists, but it was really, it, it was mainly about the science. The science was the one that was benefiting because it was getting more communication out of it, right? It, which was reflected in the institutions. Likewise, people got to be, you know, artists and residents. So it wasn't bad and it certainly wasn't bad, it was noble. But in a way, if we want to address some of these issues of inequality and inclusion that we're seeing, you have to sort of say, what's at the foundation of that? And one of it is the research question. I mean, we aren't really allowing them to operate on the same level of research because artists do research too, as do scientists. So when you sort of say, we're both doing research, Let's not just sort of say, we're talking about how great you are, but just sort of say, 
we're not, or else we're not looking at all these beautiful pictures. Let's say we're actually working on something that has artistic integrity and scientific method. So does that answer your question? I hope it does. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I think we're going to jump to the last question in the Q&A, and I expect we might have a few people jumping in on this one, but um, Jan has said that I think he wants to give an answer. So thank you to Emma Whitecamp for this question. So thank you for your thought-provoking presentations. One of the themes that connects all or most of the presentations is connections with community and potential for social change. I wonder if the speakers can comment on the ways in which they see art as playing a particular role in this context of social change slash community development. And I'll answer uh, because we work a lot with the uh, local communities when we construct the immersive performances because a lot of the times they are they translate some elements of the invisible world from astronomy or from physics and we get different outcomes uh, or different artistic works about the same theme for example about stars depending on the community because they're they are so um, immersed in the culture that they are surrounded by that we have a, i will give you an example that in one of the immersive performances we explain the death of a star or, or what a white dwarf is and one of the artists came up with the idea and in Portugal it was shown based on the uh, Pieta sculpture uh, with, uh, uh, with references to Catholicism, whatever. But, and then we've shown it in India uh, and that presentation in Portugal was full of sorrow and darkness and uh, because of death. And then it was in the south of India um, and uh, there were people attending the performance from Tamil Nadu where they actually celebrate death in a way uh, through, a, through a dance. And they wouldn't understand at all what we were communicating because death is not a reason to be sad. So in their imagination, um, a white dwarf is a completely different object or a different star and, it, and it's a completely different metaphor. So working with the community and not only uh, working from, the, from up to down, but also understanding the culture that we are working with is in my opinion, crucial. And in terms of development, you have to basically understand your audience. And, and I think that's, a, that, that's very, we, we all know this, but sometimes we forget and, and going with our work to different cultures uh, show, uh, show, shows this a lot. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What, what an amazing example to share. Thank you for doing that. Um, so I think, uh, is anyone, does anyone else want to jump in on that question? Yeah, um, Jessica, do you want to come in? I think we've got a, what, a minute or two left. Yeah, sure. Um, just in the case of people with disabilities, art is very important because it uses multimodal and different senses to approach and to communicate content. Uh, also, emotion is very important, uh, very important issue in a science museum not only for people with disabilities, but all types of publics and art is basically emotion. So I think this uh, part can be a very huge contribution. I'm, I see that Miguel is also would like to say something. So I'm going to, <laughs> to say goodbye to everyone. <laughs> Go on Miguel. Really quick, just like um, uh, with the same artistic expression, different people will have different reactions. Art can teach us that uh, with the same uh, scientific principles, different people can't understand it, but have different opinions. And I have had the experience that sometimes scientists would like for all the people to, to share their opinions. And I think art can really uh, teach us how it's, it is okay for different people to have different opinions on the same scientific matter. Well, what a wonderful point to end on, I think, at this session. We've just about run out of time. Um, I am going to put the poll up, so I'm going to do that. So I'll leave that up for um, um, a little bit of time so that people can vote for their favorite um, presentation from today. So today is the last in um, these visual presentation sessions. Um, we've had some really good feedback about them, really enjoyed attending them um, and being part of them as well. The, the um, snapshots of um, information that people have shared and the images have just been fantastic. So thank you everyone for contributing um, to these sessions and to the audience for coming along and for asking your questions as well. Um, so there are a couple of workshops coming up with the conference. 
Um, so you can check out the details of those. I think they are still available um, to book onto as well. Um, but other than that, it's going to be straight into the conference itself. So I'm really excited about um, seeing everyone there virtually um, a week on Monday um, when things get started. Um, so I'm just leaving this up a little bit because people are still putting their votes in. Um, give everyone a chance. I think this is going to be a very difficult decision for everyone. I don't think I could make this decision. I can't vote and that would be very hard to do that. Um, so I'll just leave it up for another few seconds or so. Oh, some more coming in. Right, I'm going to do a countdown of five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, that's it. I'm going to end it. Oh, someone snuck in just, oh, another one. <laughs> right, I'm going to end it. <laughs> um, so thank you all very, very much um, for this session today. And um, good evening, if you're viewing from the evening, good morning, if it's morning where you are, or good afternoon, or somewhere in between or or if it's night time thank you very much um, for joining us today and um, hope to see you all at the conference a week on Monday thank you well done <laughs> thanks everyone thanks everyone thank so much. thanks everyone thank you bye thank you bye, bye. 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 bye.